copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 167. Stand by to assist narcotic squad in apprehending dope rings. That is all. Gordon. conscious of the dangers of narcotics. Dope. Most of the nations are banded together by treaties to assist each other in stamping out the evil. Each has specialists at work on the problem. In the United States, this campaign of prevention and suppression rests in the hands of the officers of the narcotic squads, federal, state, and municipal. It is highly specialized work and danger because the narcotic agent works best when he works alone, undercover. He must meet cunning with cunning and never, never drop his disguise, which as a rule is that of a dealer in drugs. For the peddler, especially the one who deals in large amounts, is cautious, oily, and ruthless. Such is the story you will hear. The Whistling Snowbirds. October 1936. Deep in the interior of Los Angeles' oriental section, two unkempt men browse through the narrow alley-like streets. To the observer, they are just a part of the never-ending line of food-seeking scavengers whose hungry eyes seek for scraps of anything edible to stave off starvation. But under the filthy clothes, the matted beards, these two men are interested in a far greater reward than food. They are two alert, watchful narcotic squad workers. Lieutenants Wallace Greeton and Raymond Clark making careful notes as they go. A dope drive is on the way. You are uh, uh, wanting a something? Oh, uh, just looking around, seeing the sights. You uh, are having uh, money? Maybe. Uh, better, maybe you are leaving. My people not enjoying uh, a sightseer. Uh, maybe you could tell us so we might find some fun. You know, a happy fun. Uh, I'm not understanding. You leave now. Oh, sure you understand. Fun. Not understanding. So sorry. All right, all right.
following morning in Captain Eddie Chitwood's office. Uh, hiya, boys. No, oh, morning, Eddie. Hello, Eddie. Uh, how's you going? Any results? You tell him, Ray. Okay. No results, no sale, nothing. Those plant-eyed devils don't know what it means to talk. All they can say is, understanding, please. Oh, yes, understanding, please. Bunch of parrots. <laughs> you boys don't sound too happy about it. Who would? After spending nights wandering around those joints, only to hear the same thing every time we ask a question. That's the one thing you just can't do to an Oriental, Ray. <laughs> ask questions. The minute you do, they forget how to speak English. And boy, I know. Yeah, we know, too. The only trouble being the fact that we don't speak their language. Yeah, I'll tell you what we better do, boys. It's a sink there's a new shipment of morphine in town. All I can gather is a big one. Enough to supply every addict in Southern California. And what's more... We've got to locate where it's being stored, who's peddling it, and who's behind the deal. Aside from that, there's nothing to worry about, right? <laughs> That's right, Ray. Only don't sound so pessimistic about it. Now, uh, I've got an idea. Good. I'm glad somebody has an idea. I've run out of them at this point. Uh, I doubt that, Wally. Never saw the time yet when you couldn't think something up when it was needed. However, this idea of mine can only be worked by one man. How about my doing it, Eddie? Hey, wait a minute. I'm no fool. Oh, no, take it easy, easy. I haven't even told you what it's all about yet, and you're fighting about who's going to do it. Well, sure, but if there's going to be any fun... I'm, I'm going to do it alone. I was afraid of that. Yeah, this is going to be a one-man job, and here's the little man who's going to do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, boy. You mean we can't even get in on it? Well, I'll need you both a little later on, but in the beginning, you can just relax. Take it easy. Well, suppose you give us a clue. You know, a vague idea of where to ship the body and all that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'll be glad to. Well, beginning tomorrow... Captain Eddie Chitward is out of town. You know, uh, gone, left, not here. Yeah? I understand you're out of town. <laughs> right. Only I'm not out of town. Also starting tomorrow, my name is Eddie Spencer. And I don't like the police. And I'm a bigger and better morphine buyer from the East. You get it? Vaguely. You're going in for a little private dope buying. I hope. The sense is so far beyond those few little peddlers you boys have talked to. We haven't any idea who the top is. Now, this Eddie Spencer intends to spend enough time in the district to worm his way into the confidences. And eventually, I hope to meet the big boy himself. Sounds pretty risky to me, Eddie. Suppose one of those boys you sent up a while back just happens to see you. Think how much it would be worth to him to peddle that information to some of that ring. And if he did, where would you be? Floating, face down in the Los Angeles River, most likely. Exactly. Those boys don't fool around. And neither do we, Ray. So tomorrow, I'm off. You two might sort of keep a check on me if you want to, just in case I need you, but don't tell anybody else where I am. This is one of those jobs where two's more than company. It's a crowd. And the following day, Chitwood carries out the first step in his dangerous plan. Becomes Eddie Spencer, big-time dope peddler in search of morphine. For several weeks, he frequents dingy oriental dens talking just enough to let anyone interested know that he's looking for a business deal, that he has plenty of money to play with. But as the days go by and no contact is made, his hopes begin to go down. Determined to stick with it as long as is humanly possible, he continues to make the rounds. And one night, in a small restaurant, as he sits alone, finishing a tasty dinner of fried rice and shrimp, a small, nervous-looking oriental comes to his table, introduces himself. Uh, you are Mr. Spencer, yes? Yeah? That's right. Are you uh, looking for something uh, to buy? Uh, maybe. Uh, that is good. Uh, if uh, you would be interested, uh, I might be able to help you. How do I know you're on the up and up? Uh, I will show you. If you are interested at all. Well, I don't know anything about you, but I'll listen to your proposition. What's the deal? Uh, we cannot talk here. Uh, you come with me uh, to my friend. Uh, huh? no, wait a minute, listen. I don't like too many people in my business. He can tell me enough to know whether or not I'm interested right here. In the first place, what can you supply me with? Oh, not able to tell you. Uh, my friend, he knows. No, 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 I don't like it. You can take your choice now. Tell me what I want to know right now or forget the whole thing. Uh, you come with me. Uh, my friend. I uh, know. Your friend will tell me, but that's out. I don't go anywhere with you until I get an answer. If I were to tell you uh, it is uh, morphine, uh, would you come to my friend? Mm, perhaps. Then I say... Uh, it is morphine. The very best. You come now? Where is your friend's place? Uh, you come with me. I shall. Okay. I'll talk to your friend. Only I'm warning you, if this stuff isn't the best, no deal. Oh, yes. The uh, very best of stuff. You come. So Captain 
Captain Kitwood, hoping that his diminutive guide will supply the first link in his long search, patiently follows through narrow alleys, his eyes constantly watching for some sign of danger. After a seemingly endless journey, the little oriental stops before a rickety old building, motions for Chitwood to follow behind him, then opens a squeaking door, starts up a dark flight of stairs. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Yes? What is this? I don't like the look of this place. Uh, my friend is here. Uh, you come. Well, all right, then. Go ahead.
way to be the leader, and Chip would praise his part to perfection. Not one word of business has been mentioned. At no time has Okai so much as hinted at the thoughts running behind his mask-like oriental face. And yet Chitwood realizes that this is the supreme test. An old hand at narcotic investigation and familiar to the ways of the Oriental, he knows just what he is being subjected to. At each place he is being carefully studied by other members of the Dobring. As he sits in the latest one, an Oriental nightclub, his thoughts are not of the happiest. Should one person recognize him, the result would be more than unpleasant. He is in so deep, there can be no turning back now. So, surrounded by his three companions, he tries to appear unconcerned. You uh, see, Mr. Spencer, uh, my people are uh, rapidly acquiring the dance customs of your country. The music, the dance, even the dress. Yes, I noticed that. It's a surprising thing. There are many surprising things to be found here. Uh, yes, that's right, Mr. Nagai. I can see that. Things that would perhaps... Uh, Astound, even one so used to excitement. The excitement of America, I mean, after you. Yes, I uh, have no doubt of that, Mr. Nagai. No doubt at all. And after a few minutes in the nightclub, Nagai suggests another place. Accordingly, the four pay their bill and leave, moving to another club. And as they sit at their table, Chitwood suddenly looks up directly into the inquiring eyes of a small Oriental standing a few feet away. For an instant, the two stare at each other. And the Oriental turns his head away. There is no more attention to him. And Chitwood, for the first time in a long minute, breathes again. The man is a peddler who only ten years ago he had sent to San Quentin on a narcotic charge. Suddenly, a moment later, the guy suggests they go outside. After again paying a small bill, they leave the noisy club huddle in the quiet street in front. And to his surprise, Chitwood sees Shizu and Okai continue on down the street, leaving him alone with Nagai. That's the idea, Nagai. Where are your friends off to? I am telling them to go. We will talk our own, Mr. Spencer. And I still don't get it. Too many people in on a deal. No one can make any profit. We do business our own. You've been a long time coming to the point, Nagai. I've only taken the precaution necessary. Now I'm satisfied. Good. I'm informed of you are wishing five a pound. That is right? That's right. Very well. Tomorrow night, uh, you will meet me at my hotel. I will have what you desire with me. You will have a uh, necessary amount of money. Five thousand dollars. Well, I've got to test the stuff first, Nagai. Oh, that will be satisfactory, uh, when we meet, you may do so. Okay, if it's good, I'll take the five pounds tomorrow and sign a contract to buy more each month. Now then, uh, where's your hotel? I will show you now. Uh, that way, will be no mistakes made uh, tomorrow. Good enough. Let's go. Shown to a small hotel on East First Street, Chitwood asks the number of the room and is told he will be met in front. Time is set for nine o'clock. After a brief goodbye, Chitwood covers his tracks carefully and proceeds to headquarters, holds a conference with his assistants, Greeton and Clark. Now, if our luck holds, we'll have Nagai cold turkey. And if it doesn't hold, he'll have you cold copper. That's right. Now, here's what I want you boys to do. Take this address on First Street and stake out there tomorrow evening. Keep out of sight and don't let anybody get suspicious of it. As soon as Nagai tells me the stuff, I'll call you and then we can take him in. Okay, Eddie, we'll be there. And there's nothing to do now, but just wait. I'm going back to my spot before someone gets worse. See you tomorrow night at nine. Acting upon Chitwood's instructions, Clark and Greeton stake out the hotel from a small alleyway directly across the street. For several hours, they wait in silence as the minutes tick by, bringing the appointed hour closer and closer. At two minutes after nine, Clark suddenly nudges Greeton, speaks in a low whisper. There's any... Just drove up and parked over there. Yeah, I see him. Now all we've got to do is hold our fingers crossed and pray a little. Already done that. Hey, look. It is going into the hotel. No, wait a minute. Look. That guy's stopping him. They're talking. Yeah, so far, so good. And when they get inside, we better move in closer so we can hear if Eddie yells. Yeah. Watch it. Something's up. They're heading back to Eddie's car. I think something's gone wrong with our plans. What do we do now? They drive off 
we better beat it back to our car and see if we can pick up their trail. Okay. Let's go. They're doing just that. Rushing back to their car, Greeton and Clark drive around the block looking for Chitwood's car. But there's no sign of it. Accordingly, doing the only thing left to do, they start a wild drive through the narrow streets, hoping against hope that they will locate Chitwood in time to carry out their plan. And in another part of town, Chitwood obeys instructions as they are given him by Nagai, turning first right, then left, then right again, until all sense of direction is completely lost. Running the right out of this corner. Right it is. I don't quite get the idea, Nagai. You said you lived in that hotel back there on First Street. Oh, yes, sir. I said it up. But you don't. Is that right? Yes, sir. That is right, Mr. Stinson. Well, where are we going now? You will see. Turn a left here, please. It is uh, my business uh, to be very careful not to take chances, Mr. Stinson. Yeah, I agree with that, all right. Only this seems like a pretty long way to get anywhere. You will drive in direction I give you. Then we will talk. Okay, now, guys, your deal. You will uh, stop in here? Yes. Okay. Oh. Hey, what the deuce? This is within a block of the place we started from. This is our destination, however. And now, Mr. Spencer, come. We will go into my room. Oh, uh, wait a minute there. I've got an idea. Why don't you bring the stuff down here to the car? I can test it here, and if it's okay, I'll give you the money. I've got the money right here in this briefcase. Oh, why should I do that? Well, it's only that I thought it might look funny, my going in this hotel, wouldn't it? It will not look funny. Many white people go in this hotel. We were going upstairs. Oh, okay. What's the room number? You will see when we get to it. Come, please. <laughs> Getting the room number and writing it on a matchbox, dropped for his assistance to find, blocked by the wise Nagai, Chitwood follows him through the lobby of one of the district's smartest hotels. Past the elevator, up a flight of stairs to the second floor. There, Nagai puts a finger to his lips, cautions Chitwood to silence. It is best to be very quiet. My man is in the next room. He might hear us. And this is a deal between us, our own. Okay, Nagai. All right, sir. Uh, oh, coming in the side, uh. Now, please, uh, if you will show me money. Sure thing. Yes, there it is. Forty-four hundred dollars. If the stuff's okay, I'll bring you the rest tomorrow. Morphine is of uh, uh, very finest, sir. Uh. My brother, in Orient, manufactures same. It's the very best, sir. Uh. All right, let's see it. What? It is here in uh, this suitcase. Uh, this overcoat is very fine garment, Mr. Spinster. Most valuable. You see, uh, from lining, I remove these little packets. And there is your muffin. Uh, let me have one of those packets. Oh, yes, sir. Tell me. It is as I am telling you, for very finest stuff. All right, Nigga. Here's the money. <laughs> you can have the briefcase as a gift from me. Oh, 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 oh thank you, thank you. And here are rest of uh, five pounds. Mm-hmm, that's fine. Oh, by the way, Nigga, I forgot to show you something. Take a look at this. What? Oh, I do not understand. Oh, uh, don't you? It's a police badge. It means that you're under arrest. Arrest, sir. Oh, no. Oh, no. Drop those scissors. What are you doing? Oh, yes, you will. Oh, no. Get it, but we're taking it away. Nero. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to keep quiet. Oh, I'll have to use my gun on you. Oh, no. No, don't you think All right. Please. All right. No, no. You're in the spot. Oh, no. There's nothing you can do about no. it. Now, stay right here. No. Well, I'll load this morphine into your suitcase. Then you can carry it. Help anchor you down. <laughs> Getting 
Taking the now thoroughly frightened and desperate Nagai down the stairs proves to be more of a job than Chitwood has bargained for. The little Oriental is determined to break away long enough to commit suicide and avoid the disgrace of arrest. And Chitwood has the task of carrying the briefcase full of money, keeping a firm grasp on Nagai's arm, and holding his gun in readiness all at the same time. Twice on the way down, Nagai breaks away, and Chitwood has to overpower him by force. But at last, after three stops, they reach the sidewalk. And now a new problem faces Chitwood. In groups, staring at the struggling Nagai, several Orientals stand in a circle round him, hatred in their faces. Hatred for the white man who is mistreating one of their countrymen. At any moment, they threaten to turn on him and free Nagai. Tell your friends they better not stop anything, Nagai. There'll be trouble if they do. Let them go, and they will not harm you. Not a chance. I'll let loose with this gun first. There are many of them, and only one of you. Yes, if they close in on us, I'm going to let you have it, you understand? That is of no importance to me now. They will make it very unpleasant for you afterwards. I warn you would be... Oh, what is that? I I think that's what I've been hoping would arrive today. Terrible. Looks like a young lion here, Eddie. Guess we found you just in time. Uh, for once in your life, Ray, you've hit it right on the nose. Say, say how'd you find me? Clark and I have been touring the city ever since you left that hotel on First Street. Just happened to see your car up the street away from this mob here. Figured it might be you. Oh, boy, am I glad to see you. Come on, hold this mob back a while while I get our friend Nagai in the car. And keep hold of that suitcase there. It's Mr. Nagai's passport to jail. <laughs> because they're in possession of a store of their favorite narcotics or because they know where their supply can be obtained without much trouble are sure danger signs for police or federal narcotic bureaus. It means that somewhere in their strong barrier against the traffic is a leak and that the deadly drugs can be obtained with comparative ease. And every ounce of narcotic means the making of more and more dangerous criminals. In the case you have just heard, the smuggling ring was smashed by the astute, fearless detective work of one narcotic bureau official who faced a show-up by the dope peddlers. The amount of narcotics recovered by the lone work of this officer was enough to poison a whole city full of people. Realize the dangers that threaten us and those we hold dear. Make this problem a personal one, and so understand its significance to us individually and as members of a civilized community threatened by this constant danger. The work of these officers proves that crime does not pay.